Hi, my name is Dan Gardner, and I'm an associate pastor here at the Bridge Church, and we are beginning a summer series on the three post-exilic pro minor prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. If you would like to receive a weekly meditation guide for this study, um, you may let me know um, by email at dgardiner, G-A-R-D-I-N-I-E-R, at bridgebc.org, or you can text me at 970-305-1222. We refer to Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi as post-exilic prophets because they spoke on behalf of God to those who had returned to Palestine to the Promised Land following 70 years of exile in the land of Babylonia. It's commonly known as the Babylonian captivity. In 605 or 605, Six, roughly. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. 605, 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar made the land of Judah a vassal state, and he carried off the first Jewish captives to Babylon, including the prophet Daniel, who I'm sure you're familiar with. There were at least three deportations of Jews to Babylonia until 587 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar utterly destroyed the city of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. In fulfillment of prophecy, the Persian emperor Cyrus in 538, nearly 70 years later, declared that the uh, 70 years, excuse me, 70 years um, after the deportations began, the exile began, um, uh, Cyrus uh, made a decree that the Jews could return to the promised land under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And at the site of Solomon's temple, they erected an altar and began to offer sacrifices. And they also began to rebuild the temple. But because of opposition, that effort to rebuild the temple was short-lived. And um, King Artaxerxes, who was the Persian king at the time, um, issued an order to cease construction. So because of that sort of local opposition and governmental opposition, nothing was done towards the rebuilding of the temple for nearly 16 years. In 520 BC, um, the second year of Darius, the king of Persia, another king of Persia, um, under the exhortation and the challenge of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, work on the temple resumed. And this is where we engage our prophet Haggai. And the book, um, which is uh, under his name, records about 15 months of his prophetic ministry. Now, what I'd like to do in this summary of our um, uh, meditation this week is just look at, to the, look at the, uh, the people and their problem, um, the Lord's challenge and the people's response. So, um, the Lord sent Haggai to speak to the civic and the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people, to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and Joshua, who was the high priest. And his message was that the people had put off or neglected rebuilding the Lord's house. These people, the Lord says, say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, the very fact that the people said that the time has not yet come um, betrays their knowledge that they knew they were supposed to be about rebuilding the temple. When Cyrus made the decree that the Jews could go back to the Promised Land, back to Palestine, he did so with the inclusion that they would rebuild the temple and offer sacrifices for him and his family. And the people understood that this was part of God's will for them, but they said, the time has not yet come. There were too many enemies, too many things going on. The fact is, the opposition that they encountered had killed their desire or their impulse to rebuild. And so the claims that God had on their life were set aside. He was no longer a priority. What became their priority was carving out a life for themselves, building their homes, building their lifestyles. That was their priority. So the Lord confronts them. Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? While God's house still lies in or lay in ruin, these people had built their own houses and in fact paneled them. It's interesting because paneling of houses was a luxury. Solomon did that with his house when he built his house um, uh, centuries earlier. 
it's often been said that yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities. And so the people who had returned to the promised land were paneling their houses, living in some measure of comfort and ease. Now, the Lord confronts them with um, the fact that they were living in paneled houses while his house lay in ruin. And we need to understand something about the significance of the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord or the temple of the Lord was the place where God would make his presence known among his people. When Moses built the tabernacle, he called it the tent of meeting because that's where God would meet with his people and speak to them. When Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, he confessed the, with absolute wonder that the Lord who made the heavens and the earth and who could not be contained in the universe would choose to dwell among his people in the temple that he constructed. Now, certainly the temple was where the sacrificial system was carried out, but that was secondary. Fundamental to the presence of the tabernacle or the ten temple was that God had chosen to live with his people. The sacrifices came along because he needed to communicate to them that he was holy and they were not. And that some, they needed to recognize their sin and realize that something needed to be done about that. So when the returning exiles neglected their duty to rebuild the Lord's house and instead gave themselves to building their own houses and their own lifestyles, they were saying one of two things. One is that... Um, the Lord's presence among them really didn't matter, or two, that, they would, that God would be with them even though they were disobedient to his will. So they would be presuming upon God's grace and mercy. Well, God gives them a challenge and tells them to consider their ways. In other words, he comes to his people through the prophet Haggai and says, think about how things are going for you. Think about your life. How's it working out? Now, obviously, in an agrarian society, the focus is on the very basics of life, f food, drink, clothing, wages. And so the Lord says, you have sown much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your full fill. Excuse me. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. In every case, they worked hard, but it all came to naught. They were left uns unfulfilled, unsatisfied, empty. They didn't get out of life what they expected, what they hoped for. They weren't happy, fundamentally because God was not in the right place in their hearts. The Lord says that he was responsible for their disappointment in life. You look for much, he said, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labors. These people worked hard. They planted in season. They cultivated their crops. They pruned their vines and dressed their trees. They bred their livestock in season. They did everything according to the laws of nature. But it got them nothing. They weren't satisfied with the return. And the truth is, God says, I blew it all away. He was the one who brought a drought, not only upon the land, but upon men and animals as well. And the reason he did that was because my house, he said, lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Their priorities were their homes, their careers, their lifestyle, and their comforts, their security, their families. Now, there are some wonderful lessons um, here, but before we get to that, let me just draw our attention to the response. When Haggai preached this message to the people um, who had returned to the promised land, their response was remarkable. They heard in Haggai the very voice of God, and as a result, they repented. They acknowledged their neglect, and 
um, the text says that they feared the Lord. They recognized that they were in the wrong and they changed not only their thinking, but they, their behavior and they determined to um, take up rebuilding the temple. Um, took three weeks to bring them to that point. But when they expressed penitence in their heart and a repentance in their disposition and their attitude, um, Haggai says that God stirred in their spirits to enable them to carry out what God had commanded them to do. So let's um, close with a few lessons here. First of all, do we hear the voice of God in the scriptures? We shouldn't overlook this. When Haggai spoke the word of God to God's people, they heard God's voice in that and it changed them. So my question is, do we set aside time to hear him speak to us in such a way that it changes our thinking? And if we do, then God promises his spirit to stir in us and enable us and encourage us to do the very thing he wants us to do. Secondly, do we see the world as Haggai saw the world? It seems to me we have a tendency to look at the world through a scientific lens. We think we can explain everything in our lives and in the world in terms of the laws of nature. We even think that we can manipulate the laws of nature to our advantage. We think that a healthy economy is due to a healthy market forces or a healthy economic system. We think that um, we are in some ways can manage our environment and make the world a better place. But as Haggai pointed out, God was behind the laws of nature and economy. God in his wonderful sovereignty is able to use the laws of nature simply as his agent. He uses nature as his agent. He's behind it and he can control it in such a way that he doesn't violate the laws of nature, but he can use them in such a way as to accomplish his purpose. So uh, my question is, in all the fruitlessness and frustrations of our attempts to make life in this world work, do we see the hand of God blowing it all away? because he is not in his right place in the hearts of his people. Thirdly, do we long for and work for God's presence among us? Or are we putting off that um, part of our lives until sometime in the future? Right now, we may be engaged in establishing our career, growing our families, or carving out some sort of lifestyle that we've dreamed of. But God wants to live with his people. That's what's fascinating about um, the book of Haggai is that God is saying he wants to live and dwell among his people. What a remarkable um, uh, thing of grace that um, God offers his people to live among them. But that wasn't important to them. At least it wasn't as important as building a life for themselves. And so um, the application for us is, where do we stand with this? Is God's house, and it's not a building today, it's God's people, is it a priority in our lives? Is it more important than the lifestyle we're pursuing? Are we committed to building up the church by building up her people? Admittedly, it's difficult in, in these um, days of COVID-19 with all of the restrictions of um, social engagement. But phone calls and cards and and um, text messages or emails or, or discipleship groups or participating in church at home. Those are ways that we can continue to build up the church and experience God's presence among us. So this um, third uh, application is, is this a priority for you and your family? Do you long for and work for the presence of God among us? Finally, are you satisfied? Are you happy? Have you taken time to consider your ways and what the Lord may want to say to you through the circumstances of your life? In the meditation that I sent out, um, I opened that with a um, statement by Hudson Taylor, who founded China Inland Mission, was a missionary in China for over 51 years. He said, God's will done God's way never lacks God's provision. It strikes me that, 
that um, it's, it's worth pondering that sometimes when we don't experience God's provision, it would be worth thinking about whether or not we are doing his will, his way. Hudson Taylor also said in another place, the real secret of an unsatisfied life lies too often in an unsurrendered will. The people in Haggai's day knew what God's will was, but they hadn't surrendered to it. As a result, their life was very unsatisfying. And so perhaps God would call you and me just to um, consider our ways. Are we satisfied with our life? Have we surrendered our wills to His? You see, in the lives of the people in Haggai's day, God loved His children enough to make their lives unsatisfactory, unsatisfying, disappointing, because He had something more satisfying and more fulfilling for them, and that was a relationship with him and his presence in their lives. So consider your ways. Perhaps the Lord wants to say something to you as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the scriptures. You use them in a mighty way to um, bring us to yourself and also to conform us to the likeness of your son, Jesus. You use the scriptures to reveal your heart to us, your will for us. And your word also has the power to bring about repentance. And then you promise that by your spirit you will work in us what's pleasing to you. So Lord, give us a love for your word and let us be attentive to the things you say. And I pray for us that we would also take time to consider our ways and see if there's something that you want to address in our lives somewhere where we may not be surrendered to your will. Father, we praise you that you're the God of grace and mercy who longs um, to make your presence known to your people, who longs to live with us. So Lord, build your church. Give us a passion to encourage and build one another up so that we might grow in knowing you and knowing your presence in, um, in and among us as your people. Thank you for what you're doing among us here at the bridge. Um, be honored and glorified, Lord, in our lives and give us a passion to build up your church in Christ's name. Amen.